Hello, we're back again with some updates to our next game. We said we wanted to finish what we have. Turns out it's quite a lot and maybe, just maybe, even the beta version will still take some time until we publish it. Let's not waste any more time and jump straight into what we did last month. As I already mentioned, we wanted to have a few customization options for the player. So, it was time to start working on the shop. Since we didn't want to model any more cars, the only thing we could change were the textures and the colors of the car. The system is pretty similar to Geometry Dash. In case you don't know the game, you can select sprites and then color them in with the ones you've already unlocked. I wanted to make the system easily adjustable, so I based the whole thing on an array with textures and prices. So we can just swap out and add textures whenever we want to. The shop for the colors also works in this way, being based on an array filled with color and price information. The only problem? You can't design a fixed UI for a flexible system. So, I left the problem for future me and just moved onto pieces of the interface, which could be fixed. For example, the shop for unlocking new biomes. We don't plan on changing them much. Designing that was rather easy and with a few tweaks I had a blank default shop element. For the flexible shops, I turned that into a prefab and whenever the player opens the shop, the game just needs to spawn as many elements as there are items in the shop, customizing the previews and prices on the buttons and figuring out the whole family relationships between all of the game objects. I had to work my way through all of the prefabs using a lot of get child and get sibling functions and finally it worked. The next thing to do was the shop for getting diamonds and coins. If you'd like to support us, you can buy some diamonds from the shop. Later on, you will be able to use them for buying coins or unlocking new stuff in the game. But of course, there will be also a way to get diamonds for free. The last important thing for the shop was designing the icons. A few months ago, I did, in my opinion, a pretty good drawing by tracing over my pixel art and GIMP. I decided to keep that art style, made a rough pixel art sketch for each icon and then traced it. After a while, I just skipped the pixel art step and simply drew stuff. I kinda got lost in making them, so here are a few failures and also some of the final versions. In the beginning, I worked on the one for the color shop. The first thing that came to mind was a color palette, but it didn't quite work out. Eventually, I settled for a color wheel, first without and later with a color picker. The map shop's icon had a few more iterations. I always wanted to represent all of the four biomes in the icon and that was a challenge. These pictures are relatively small and obviously you should be able to recognize each biome. I started out with a bad drawing of each biome, but eventually, after a few tries, I arrived at the final version with a circle split up into four parts. Luckily, the rest of the icons were easy and I finished them without too many changes. Although the shop took longer than expected, not that's the norm as a game dev or anything, but I'm really happy with how everything turned out. The icons look good, the shop looks good, and most importantly, everything works. Making a customization was probably one of the most complex systems in the game. I will tell you how the finished product works and just explain the code a little bit. So, being able to switch between different white and black patterns was not that hard. Just changing the texture on the material in Unity. There is a main and a secondary color and the player can change both to any color they have unlocked. Let's say your car is red and blue and you want to change the blue to green. It kind of works like the bucket tool in paint. All of the blue parts turn to green. And then you can switch the reds to orange, and if you don't like the orange, then switch the orange to pink, and so on and so forth. On the coding side, when there is a white and black texture and the player wants to change the black to something else, then I get all the black pixels from that texture and store them in a variable. And then I change all of them to a new color. It doesn't sound complicated, yeah? Believe me, it is. I will just spare you the details because it would be a long and boring part if I were to explain all of this. More important is that you can have a single colored car too, and yes, it was a pain in the ass to implement that little feature. Maybe it's easier to explain that bug that caused me so many problems in paint. So, when there's a white and black texture and the player changes their main and secondary color to orange, if you now use the bucket tool then all of them change to a different color and not only the ones which were black before. Saving all of this data was a struggle too but at some point it finally worked. After a few weeks of only working on this system, or maybe I just said at some point that all of the bugs from now on are intended features. No, seriously, I just hope it works now without any more errors. I've already covered the story of why we call the game Mission Drift. But we needed some distinction between the Game Jam original and this expanded and enhanced version. Coming up with a name wasn't easy. There are already lots of racing games on Google Play. So it took some time finding an original name. Mission Drift Secret Race Hidden Trails of Forgotten Lands, all were names we considered. But the final name will be 
Drum roll, please. Mission Drift Lost Tracks. A lot of those names were already taken, but at least at the time of this recording, there is no app on Google Play called Lost Tracks. While we are already talking about the name of the game, let's also discuss the icon. We already had an icon for the first Mission Drift game, and I think it looks pretty good. The goal was to improve upon the first one, but keep the general style the same. The camera being at an angle state, and of course, also the car. Instead of being just a bunch of red walls, the background should be more interesting. Version after version, we added more models from the game and tried around a bit, seeing what works best. In the beginning, we just had the volcano area and the icon, but with time, we added things from all the biomes until we arrived where we are now. We rendered the foreground and the background separately to avoid some weird reflections and the last thing to do was to combine the two pictures, add a sky and clean up the image a bit. Maybe you have noticed some inconsistencies with the visuals in the gameplay clips. For example this here or this tree here. Sometimes there are bad shadows or poorly lit parts. That is because of a thing called light maps. To give you a general overview on what that is, it is a way to light the game in an efficient way. Many games use real-time lighting, in that case all the lights and shadows are calculated while the game runs. But why don't we just use real-time lighting then? Good question, it's because we want to have Mission Rift for mobile, and most of the hardware on mobile phones isn't good enough to handle real-time lighting, at least not for 3D games. Light maps are way more efficient, because all the lighting information is calculated beforehand. That is called baking the light map and then the light map is just applied to the 3D models. One drawback is that you cannot have dynamic shadows, which means that all the moving parts like the player can't have a shadow. Of course there are hybrid solutions too which use both real time and baked lights. This isn't a problem with our game since the only moving part is the car and even if it had a shadow it would be right under the car so you wouldn't see it anyway. Baking the lights is somehow not that easy, at least not for noobs like us who use this lighting system for the first time. Some spots are darker than others, some are bright and there are even some trees which just stay black. It looked awful the first few times we tried it out, so if you saw any weird lights throughout these devlogs it's because of the bad light maps. But then we noticed a big problem, the file size of the light map was almost 500 megabyte. To give you a comparison that is almost double the size of games like Clash of Clans. And the actual game is not even included in this calculation. The light map was on a lower resolution too, so if we were to use a higher quality light map, the game could easily end up being over 1GB big. For a PC game that's not a lot, but for a mobile game it is. The solution to this problem is simple, just don't use light maps. Is it really a solution? Well, kinda. Maybe it's also good, because even with the light maps the game didn't exactly look how we wanted it to be. Probably because we haven't figured out yet how to bake the lights correctly. But we can't use real time lighting either. Somehow just disabling all the lights doesn't make the whole game dark, instead it looks pretty good. Except for the pine trees maybe, they could use some lights, but I guess that's a compromise we'll have to make. Most of it is great, the colors are saturated and there are no dark spots. We're not sure how this lighting works, we assume the game is in an unlit state somehow. But you know what they say, if it ain't broken don't fix it. So the soon might have been a little too confident. There's some <coughs> things holding back our productivity a bit, but of course there were also lots of smaller things that we forgot about. Just have a look at our quick fix list on Trello. What's our current plan then? Well, it stays mostly the same. We'll finish up what we've got now and publish it as a beta for people to check out. Then, based on feedback and response, we'll see what to make of the project. As always, all of our other games are still available on the Play Store. Check them out if you want. That's everything for now, we'll be back once we've got more to show. Until next time and goodbye.